we're going to talk about reversing the great transformation. And basically in this uh, talk, I will try to present the results of decades of research in 40 minutes. So I'll try for simplicity and clarity, but this may not be achievable. I have uh, provided links to these slides and within the slides, there are other links to more detailed explanations of some of the things that I will be talking about. So without further ado, let's begin. So there are always more than one way of looking at things. And in fact, I would like to say that there are 7 billion different perspectives on the world that we live in. Objectivity is the greatest myth that we have been educated to believe in, that there is a way to look at the world which is free from all uh, subjective biases. There are no objective points of view. And since that's the case, the next best thing is the ability to look at multiple perspectives on the world we live in. And so a paradigm is one framework for looking at the world. And it's very helpful for our self-liberation to be able to look at radically different perspectives from the one that we have. So I'm going to present a non-Eurocentric view of the um, world. Win. So, um, and I'm going to talk about the great transformation, which was took place from a traditional Christianity-based society to secular modern society. Economics was a branch of moral philosophy and Adam Smith was a moral philosopher. And this morality was grounded in Christianity and that was called the scholastic school. The great transformation turned economics into objective science on par with physics and with nothing to do with the morality on the surface. The non-Eurocentric view that I will describe will be easily understood by pre-modern Europeans, but would be almost incomprehensible to secular modern people. And that doesn't mean Europeans only, uh, anyone who has received a Western education, and that's basically all educated people on the planet, uh, absorb a Eurocentric worldview. So we all know that the current state of the planet is really very bad. And uh, I just don't need to count the list of horrors that we are seeing all around. So one of the reasons for this is the myth of objectivity, the idea that there is a collection of facts, which is true. And in fact, I have access to this and nobody else has. So people who agree with me, they are also factual and rational. And anybody who doesn't agree just doesn't have access to the facts and is also irrational. So once you realize that there are no facts, there are only subjectivities, uh, this kind of um, arrogance, epistemic arrogance would not be, be possible. So I read a long time ago and I, can, I tried to find this quote, but I couldn't, that our ability to learn the truth is limited by our courage. When I first read this, this struck me as very strange because I also trained in the Western intellectual tradition. So I was taught to believe that truth depends on facts and logic and not in the feelings on, of our hearts. But courage is very much a quality of the heart. So how can we understand this apparent paradox? When people trained in the binary logic of true, false, uh, it's very hard to understand what courage has got to do with truth. We have been trained to believe in a model of knowledge whereby we learn something and then we learn more and more and more and ultimately we become all knowledgeable or as knowledgeable as we are going to get. But suppose this model is wrong. Suppose that like Kuhn discovered, uh, science procedures and revolutions. We have one framework, one idea, one paradigm about the world. Then we throw it away and we start all over again with a completely new and different paradigm, like the shift from Ptolemaic to the heliocentric, uh, to the Copernican model. So this is actually how uh, courage matters in the sense that uh, personally when I found that the frameworks that I had used to analyze the world I live in were wrong because they had led me to be miserable. So I said that I have to abandon these and start rethinking how to live from scratch and at that point uh, I had to say that if I abandon everything, then I know nothing. Everything that I have believed up till now has proven false. So that was when lyrics of Paul Simon, I have come to doubt. All that I once held was true. They became very uh, significant. And so you see, I have come to doubt. 
all that I once held is true. So, in the mainstream European intellectual tradition, and we are all part of this tradition, uh, the, uh, the essence of truth was lost. Uh, now, there are exceptions to this everywhere, even within, within the European tradition and in the East as well. The spirit of humanity shines through and our intuitive and heartfelt connection to truth is the same for all of humanity. No differences between East and West there. So we're going to look for what was lost on the path to modernity. Unfortunately, it, it, this, uh, this thing that was lost cannot be found under the light of reason and logic and facts, which is what knowledge is confined to. But so the key thing that uh, matters is that the most important questions in life, life became meaningless. What does that mean? What is the meaning of life? Who am I? What are the hidden potentials within my soul? What should I be doing with this extremely short and precious life that I have been given? So in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, deep thought thing is about the ultimate question and comes up with the answer 42. So this is just a reflection of the tendency that we have been trained to believe that these deep questions are unimportant, are meaningless, and not worth um, pondering because they have no answers. So there are even deeper questions which arise. How did these questions become meaningless? It's not true that they were always uh, treated as jokes. Uh, rather, people paid very serious attention to them and there were major disputes. So we need to relearn why questions are important because we have been trained to believe that they are irrelevant and we have to learn to find the answers. And ultimately also, how does this relate to the great transformation? Well, one aspect of the great transformation was the loss of meaning of life. So where do we look for the answers? How did this, how did this happen? Well, um, this is an unexpected source for the problems we face today. Who would think that philosophy has anything to do with it? So actually there were multiple wrong turns which took place in the Western philosophical tradition. And I've discussed these at length elsewhere and I won't take the time to discuss it here. But uh, the story is a bit confused because there are three kinds of philosophy. There's highbrow philosophy in which the big questions continue to be discussed, but they are no longer the center stage of philosophy. And then there is middle brow philosophy, which is philosophers extending to public. But what really matters is the folk philosophy, uh, which is how the, how the philosophy affects the common people. And the common people include uh, students who are getting PhDs in economics because they are ignoramuses philosophically, as I was. Uh, so this folk philosophy is extremely important and highly neglected when people, when I say that people have been misled by logical positivism, a philosopher say, no, that philosophy has been dead for 50 years. Nobody believes in it anymore. That may be true at uh, highbrow and partly true at middlebrow, but in folk philosophy, posit positivism is uh, very much alive and well. There's a very interesting article in Wikipedia, which says that if you take any article at all in Wikipedia, and you click on the first link and you keep doing that, ultimately you end up with the article which is classified as philosophy. So what this shows is the all human knowledge, knowledge is founded on philosophical basis. And so what I want to say about this, there are three things that I want to say in this slide. One is that all knowledge has philosophical foundations. Two is that very few people are aware of this. And the third is that massive confusion is caused by failure to distinguish between the three levels of philosophy. So some of the critical errors which uh, took place in the development of Western philosophy was dualism, the split between the mind and the body. Now we all know that I think, and by thinking I can uh, affect the, the motion of my body. But philosophers deny this because they say, well, how can mind uh, thought act on the body. Everything must be subject to natural law. And this natural law leads to the idea of determinism, again, which is vastly 
in conflict with our personal experience. Uh, we all experience uh, the free will as a, map, a part of our lives. But philosophers tell us that, no, this is an illusion. And then this positivism that knowledge comes from facts and logic. Science is built on facts, facts and logic. And this is the only valid type of knowledge. And the real tragedy of this is the exclusion of the heart and souls. Our emotion and our spiritual experiences don't provide us with knowledge at all. So this exclusion of subjectivity has been a tremendous loss. So um, you can gather all of this by uh, confining attention to logical positivism, which sort of en encapsulates all of the errors that I have been talking about. And uh, we can summarize it as this, the world that we see consists of appearances, which are observed, which are observable. And then there is the hidden reality, which generates these appearances. So in uh, economics, the paradigmatic example for this is the behavior of human beings. Economics, the critical e issue is the, uh, we see, we observe actions of human beings, but we don't know what's inside their hearts, what motivates them. So positivism tells us that ignore what's going on inside human beings. Just focus on what you can see, how they act. Oh, this is um, encapsulated in revealed preference theory. You can look at the choices. Don't worry about what heart. And this is a big mistake. So the social sciences, we are, we are used to thinking, believing that social sciences are uh, go back a long time. Economics goes back to Adam Smith. But this is not true. Modern economics and the social sciences were born in the early 20th century, on the 20th century, on the basis of a double mistake. One was a misunderstanding of what science is that is captured by logical positivism. Logical positivism was actually an attempt to understand and explain what science is, but it fails miserably at this. And then um, since uh, the misconception was born, again, the only valid type of knowledge is scientific knowledge. So the attempt was to ma made to cast all of the humanities uh, to study, restudy it via the scientific method. And this is what led to the name of social science. And uh, so the idea that we can apply scientific method to the study of um, human societies, this has uh, been a disaster. And uh, this is the disaster that we are currently living through. So 19th, uh, the modern economics was born in the 1930s with Lionel Rab Robbins in the scarcity definition. Lionel Rab Robbins in the scarcity definition. And uh, Samuelson gave it a definitive shape in his book. He's uh, the founder of modern economics. And basically the transition <clears throat> which has been, which was made was a shift. Economics was previously a contributes to human welfare. The idea of human welfare is an internal idea, um, which, which has to do with our hearts and souls. So this was discarded and uh, only the observable choices were uh, taken into account. And that's where the scarcity, scarcity definition came in. So before scarcity, we could distinguish between needs and wants. So we could distinguish between a hungry man looking for bread and a, a, and a millionaire looking for a car. But after scarcity, uh, both of these are just um, uh, demands. And uh, if the billionaire has the money to fulfill his demand, then that's, uh, it's efficient to fulfill that and leave a billion people hungry because they don't have the money. There are no moral judgments involved. This is just the way the system works. So what I would like to say is that this was a big mistake. Economics cannot be a branch of natural science. It has to be, and it remains a branch of moral philosophy. But the only problem is that morality has been hidden within mathematics. So the issue is to find out how moral judgments are hidden within mathematics. So one of the important books which helps us in this regard is a philosophy like that facts and values are inextricably entangled. I like this phraseology. So there's a book which I have pictured, uh, Economic Analysis by Hausman and McPherson, which explains how <clears throat> all of economics 
uh, immorality, moral judgments permeate, the moral judgments permeate all of economics and policy. A single specific example of this is scarcity, the idea that the scarcity is foundation of modern economics. This uh, <clears throat> idea is based on three normative judgments. One of them is the private property idea that the idea that what I have belongs exclusively to me and uh, I have the right to do with it what I please and I have no uh, the society has no rights over me in terms of how I use my property. All of these are moral ideas and, and there are most societies don't accept these ideas. Uh, the second one I've already mentioned that is and wants ex distinction. Tastes are exogenous. This also leads to scarcity. And uh, then the strict discipline boundaries. So ignoring politics and psychology. Again, this is important to in, in order to make scarcity the central notion of economics. So, so point be, be here being that morality is embedded in economics, but it is hidden and it pretends to be objective, but it's actually uh, built on moral foundations, which are toxic. So how did this come to be? Again, it's useful to make a brief uh, excursion history. There were centuries of devastating religious wars between Protestants and Catholics. And this led, this actually personally impacted the lives of the Enlightenment philosophers, some of whom were uh, under threat of excommunication. And all of them suffered from the religious wars uh, in some way or the other. So basically, they started, they started searching for a tolerant society philosophy, and uh, they rejected Christianity as a basis for building society, which was very sound in the sense that uh, that was their experience. And so, but having rejected Christianity, you are at a loss because all that you know has been rejected. And so you have to start rebuilding knowledge from. And so what happened was that they jumped onto the idea that science is the only producer of valid knowledge, and we should only trust what we can see and touch. And we should not trust our experience and our hearts because these testify to a greater reality. So our hearts, so our hearts deceive us. So that's why we have been trained to ignore our hearts. And so believe models which, which just seem absurd to us. Uh, we have learned to believe in models which are absurd. And so basically, scientism is the faith in the ability of science to answer all important questions. But of course, science cannot answer the questions about meaning of life. So the, what was the impact on modern economics? It led to an absurd theory of, of human behavior, the homo economicus who, who maximizes pleasure obtained from goods and services. Nobody does that in the, on the whole planet, whole planet. So the question is, how are we trained? How are we deceived into believing this? And of course, if you are doing social science, then the fundamental unit of behavior is the human being. And so if you, if you have a terrible theory for behavior for human beings, then um, you will have a bad theory of society. And then the second problem is the absurd idea that economic laws are like the laws of physics. This again comes from the idea of social science. Economic laws, to the extent that there are any, place with culture and society, with social norms. And this is so easy to prove that it's really hardly a, a question. Uh, nonetheless, the idea that economics as a science suggests that there are economic laws which can be found, which are invariant to time and place and same across all societies. So the laws for Bolivia and Brazil, Brazil and the laws, economic laws in the Middle Ages are the same as the laws for modern society. It's just absurd. And again, the third absurd idea, which is on which uh, modern economics is built, is the idea that economics can be studied in isolation from politics, from society, from geography. This is a deeply flawed methodology, which is the basis of modern economics. And I have written a paper about how it happened that we were able to put forth models which should just be laughed at instead of debated seriously. And this has to do with, again, uh, Kant tells us about uh, the noumena, which is the unobservable reality, and the phenomena, which is what we can observe. And from what we observe, we try to deduce what is going on 
in the hidden reality. So that's the, our mental models of reality. Prior to Kant, it was thought that a good, it was thought that a good model tells us if uh, what's happening in the real world. So we, we, the standard for judgment for a good model is that it matches the hidden reality. But what Kant said was that this is an impossible task because you never know what, what is un unobservable. So we should abandon this. Instead, what he said was that uh, that is a hopeless project. So let's do something else. Instead of looking for a match between our mental models and the hidden reality, let's try to figure out how our mental models are created from the observable data and from the prior knowledge that we have. So this was basically the aband abandonment of the attempt to find out what is going on inside human beings. So uh, if we talk in terms of methodology, uh, there was a shift from surrogates to substitute models in the terminology of uh, one of the philosophers of science. So a surrogate model is a substitute for reality and it is judged by seeing how well it works as a substitute in the sense of how well it matches uh, reality. But a substitute model is just ignores reality completely and uh, presents uh, us with an alternative. So Lucas, Lucas says that anthropologists study real societies, but we economists simply make up artificial societies uh, which are populated by robots and we study these societies. Uh, the robots are home and, and we make our deductions about the real world economics by studying a world which was full of robots with, uh, without any was full of robots with, uh, without any feelings and uh, we discuss what economic policy would be like this is exactly what the economists do today the models are models of a soulless and heartless world and um, these are what you use to decide what economic policies we should follow so this methodology important models will have wildly inaccurate assumptions because there is no match for reality is no longer a relevant criteria and the consequence of this is bob solo says that lucas model is lunatic asylum class he literally says that and um, engaging it with it means seriously instead i just laugh at it but solo criticizes lucas's model but not the methodology which was used in producing models so solo himself produces a lot of uh, crazy models but he thinks that they are reasonable and uh, the ones that Lucas uses are not reasonable, but they're all crazy models. They have no match. They're all crazy models. They have no match to the real world and they don't even try to achieve this. So the, uh, instead of trying to find the good models, some models are bad and some models good. We say that the whole methodology is bad and we need to go back. The the idea came up some time ago that reality is so complex that no model can capture it. <clears throat> and so all models are false. This is true. Nonetheless, the effort to try to match reality and to simplify it is useful. But this idea was abandoned. And so you, you can make literally just too much arbitrarily, uh, arbitrariness. We can say that, okay, there are gremlins behind the scenes and they do everything and they are not subject to laws. So economists came up with a protocol, which was optimization and equilibrium. <clears throat> so any model which has optimization and equilibrium qualifies as a model. And then they are judged on, on their match to something or the other. So within this methodology, there is no fix that is possible to economic theory at all. <clears throat> so the alternative is to go back to a qualitative and historical methodology. This was actually originated by Ibn Khaldun. Um, um, and one of the greatest masters of this methodology is Polanyi. This methodology has now been forgotten. So if we want to go back, and I think that that's one of the things we need to, when, when we say reversing the great transformation, one of the things involved in this is to change the methodology that we use for social science. Social science tells us how we should build society. And uh, it's completely rotten to the core. So we need to uh, rebuild all of the social sciences from scratch and we need to rebuild it using a historical and qualitative methodology but uh, nobody knows how to do that anymore because this methodology has been lost and forgotten so it's a uh, useful uh, place to start and there are three principles that i've listed here one is that theories are born as an attempt to understand history 
and then theories are used to generate policies how to respond to that history so they shape history for on this uh, how theories shape and are shaped by history so basically the interaction between theories and history is necessary you can't understand a theory outside its historical context so when we study keynesian economics we can't understand what keynesian economics is without studying the great depression without studying the great depression because keynesian economics was a response to the great depression so modern methodology uh, textbooks teach you keynesian economics but they don't mention the great depression and so basically it's uh, impossible the task that is being done a second principle is that uh, economics is based on methodological individualism but actually it is groups communities shared ideas common visions which change history so we need to look at uh, the group level mesoeconomics instead of microeconomics and finally we need to consider the process of social change unfolds in all dimensions simultaneously political economic environmental environmental so we need to study them together you can't study economics in isolation so the goal of uh, uh, polani goal of ibn khaldun was to study the process of social change note how this is different from studying equilibrium there are no equilibrium in our society if you just open your eyes from the textbook the world is continuously changing there are no equilibrium to be found so the thing uh, studying equilibrium is studying a hopelessly uh, useless concept instead we should try to learn if there is any system any patterns in the process of social change so some of the things that <clears throat> polani talks about <clears throat> polani talks about how we go about studying social change he says that there is usually a trigger for social change uh, some exogenous event the, like the great depression um then uh, people try to understand this um, change which is occurring in before their eyes and they develop theories theories to uh, to understand the change so many different theories are developed by many different classes and these theories have multiple functions uh, they define goals for a particular class of people they define identities they create alliances they build communities they provide the theories provide, uh, allow us to create a policy response but there's also another important function for theories that they have to have a broad appeal because if you want to enact policy so theories are also designed to appeal to a broad class which means that they hide their class uh, um, orientation the the the, 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 the uh, like um, laissez faire is very beneficial to the wealthy because it says I, we can do whatever we want with our wealth but it is presented as a policy which is fair to all because it says everybody can do whatever they like and this doesn't this this seems to be fair but is actually very beneficial to the wealthy and very harmful to the people so the theories have to make appeal to a broad class of people so <clears throat> coming back to real world economics uh, what polani says about the uh, great transformation is that the driver of the change was the industrial revolution the invention of big the invention of big machines is what he calls it so once big machines came into existence then um, they led to excess production now the excess production is a problem because uh, pre modern society people prized self sufficiency so if you are self sufficient you don't want want to produce more why produce more than what you need and you don't want to consume more than what you already have so what you need to do is to create desire in consumers to have more um also you need to create money because if you sell a lot of useless stuff to people uh turn so you create this token money which enables you to get stuff in the future so sort of uh, uh, and and of course this money uh, has to command social consensus to be useful so a whole set of mechanisms has to be created to give value to money and to enable it to be used as a universal token of uh, uh, purchasing power uh, so there are three basic artificial commodities which polani mentions one of them is money and the other two are money and the other two are land and labor so if we organize production we have to use labor and we have to use land as factors of production but these are not 
commodities in the sense that they are not produced by the market. They are given to us beforehand. And so uh, this commodification causes the um, capitalism uh, when, by commodifying la land and labor, by making human beings resources for sale on the market, automatically creates the worship of gold. If you can use money to buy and sell human beings, then there is no, there is no doubt that um, money is the most important thing in the world. And that is, what, um, that is what capitalism does. It teaches us to believe that money is the most important thing in life. Uh, now, um, what is exactly the Great Transformation? Uh, what, uh, how Polanyi defines it, there is lots of debate. There is lots of debate about it, but uh, one simple idea is that uh, in normal society, uh, markets are part of society, are embedded within society. But in after the Great Transformation, society became embedded within markets. So what does this mean? It's useful to understand this clearly. So suppose I need medicine to save the life of my child, and I go and say, "Oh my, I don't have the money to buy this, but please give me this because I need it to save the." life of my child. So there's a social relationship between me and the shopkeeper. As human beings, we participate in the pain of the others. And so on the basis of human relationship, he should give me the medicine. And the gratitude that I feel to him, I feel to him will be more valuable than any amount of money that I could give him. And uh, everybody understands that. But there is a market relationship. He's a shopkeeper. I'm a customer. I don't have money. So in, in, in the, if the market relationship is trumps the social relationship, then we have a market society. If the social relationship is stronger than the market relationship, then we have a traditional society. So one of the books uh, Amartya Sen wrote a long time ago showed that famines occur not because there is scarcity of food, but because people don't think, society doesn't think that these people are entitled to it. That is, if we had some, uh, that as a, it is the collective responsibility of society to feed anyone who is hungry, and this is part of Islamic law, for example, then uh, famines would not occur because we don't, uh, it doesn't matter how the person is hungry. It doesn't matter why he has no money to purchase. If there's someone hungry, then it is our collective responsibility to ensure that uh, we get, get him food. So what happened as a result of the emergence of capitalism? Uh, I've already said that it's about worship of money and the commodification of land and labor. So it's very strange that the 40s, uh, what Polanyi wrote was uh, amazingly prescient. And uh, actually, the reason to go through this is to understand that these are the toxins which have been implanted in our brains by the education that we have received. And reversing the great transformation involves self analysis to how this poison affects our thought and actions, and to liberate ourselves from these. One of these is the birth of the, uh, the Industrial Revolution led to a greed that all human problems can be solved by uh, material commodities, by wealth. So this is tox number one. Uh, the antidote or the correction is to look at the Eastern paradox, which shows that money does not buy happiness. Uh, um, commodities don't bring us long-run pleasure. Long-run pleasure depends on social relationships, social relationships, or and on character traits, not on amount of money and not on our consumption levels. Uh, so, money doesn't buy happiness. Uh, the commodification of labor uh, means that our educational systems are designed to produce human resources, not human beings. And how do, how do you turn a human being into a human resource? You have to strip them of their relationship to their society, to environment, to their history, to all higher visions relating to how I strive for something which is bigger than myself. Uh, so this all this has to turn us into a human resource. And the commodification of land leads to uh, the... Um, environmental catastrophe that we are seeing because the land, the flora, the fauna, their value is reduced to what their market price is. So if you have a species of animals that um, uh, we can't buy or sell or trade in the market, then it's worthless. It's worth zero. 
And basically, this problem, this is the source. This 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 mental attitude which has been created on us by living in a market society, that the worth of something is worth, that's the source of the environmental catastrophe. So we have been trained to think of ourselves as inputs to the production process. And we, we have been trained to value ourselves in terms of our lives in the terms of money that we can make. Value ourselves in terms of our lives in the terms of money that we can make. And these are all uh, toxic ideas, deadly to our personal lives and to our long-term welfare. So now we come to the uh, final section, uh, which is what can we do about this? Uh, so, uh, so because the great transformation was so great, so we'll need to make great efforts to undo it. Uh, where uh, the great transformation created a market society. We all live in this market society. Everything is valued in monetary terms and everything is for sale. So we have to understand that the central driver of new status uh, in a capitalist society, the money is the biggest marker of social status. So we all seek money, not because money brings us happiness, but because money brings us social status and that's what we are all hungry for. So uh, we need to, if we want to stop valuing money, then we have to change our reference community, change our reference communities. We have to find friends who don't value money, value something else, value something, value higher goals. And we have to you know, de-link our self-image from what society thinks of us and, 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 and uh, find healthier communities ponder is what's the purpose of my life? What are the goals worth striving for? And in particular, we must reject the capitalist answer that the purpose of life is the pursuit of profits, pleasure, and power. And the positivist answer is that this question itself is meaningless because there's no facts and logic which can be used to answer it. And the existentialist answer, which, the existentialist answer, which is what I started out when I first uh, uh, encountered these problems, uh, my own experience is that this is also a deadly answer that existence precedes essence, which means that we build, create our own meaning. As individuals, we are not capable of creating meaning. We need to do, uh, we need to look at a higher level. And so we adopt an attitude of epistemic humility. Uh, I cannot find the answer on my own, but large numbers of philosophers and, and religious traditions have grappled with these questions over centuries. So let's latch on to a tradition and study what it has to offer. And uh, lead, let our heart guide us the direction because logic and facts cannot. Oh, very young one, will you leave us this time? You're only dancing on the surf for a short while. So we have short lives, and uh, critical is that we can't any any individualism is, is a toxin. You can't achieve anything. You can't be anything on your own. You have to find communities and build communities to and uh, one of the things is uh, for detoxification is to spend some time living close to nature so i was recently in the usa and uh, the appalachian trail i saw lots of people with a backpack uh, traveling for months it, it seems like a crazy thing to do and i think it is a crazy thing to do but it does ac accomplish uh, something which is it shows you that you don't need to follow uh, the capitalist, but you can live with a backpack and a pair of clothes and clothes to nature for, for a long time. And that's what we need to do. And this is my last slide. I've recently joined Ahuat University, which uh, Ahuat Foundation has gives microfinance to a lot of people. And um, that is, it gives interest-free loans to people to allow them to build their lives. And it has done an uh, enormous amount of work. So they have recently launched this university, which will provide a free education to everyone in uh, everyone in Pakistan who is uh, eligible. Uh, and eligibility, poverty is uh, yeah, is one of the criteria. But our goal will not be to be give them a university education. Uh, one of the ways in which we will distinguish our goal is we'll take students who are imbued with the desire to serve humanity. We don't want students who will be looking for degrees and careers to make names for themselves and and, and to pursue their individual lives. We want students who will, who are built with the desire to uh, serve humanity and they will, we will teach them the agriculture they need, need to go back to their rural communities and serve and help to upgrade them. 
and we will give them real world skills as, as opposed to book book knowledge which has no value at all and we will teach them to build communities and we will teach them about history and uh, the real world economic society as opposed to the textbook theories of social sciences which basically abstract from european historical experience and are completely irrelevant for pakistan so this is oh i guess i have one more slide uh if you want to see more along these lines there is a talk that i gave earlier in helsinki on sustainable development and uh, this has develops the ideas of how we can become the change that we want to see so as this uh, picture shows the task that is facing us so enormous the fire that has been uh fire that has been uh lit in this world by capitalism is so enormous we as individuals are so tiny that it seems completely ho hopeless uh, futile to try why should we even make the effort but each drop of rain contributes very little collectively the raindrops are enough to put out the fire and so we have to shift from outcome orientation to process orientation outcome orientation is looking at whether or not we can put out the fire and process in, uh, process orientation is am i part of the solution or am i part of the problem so as long as we are doing what we can we are doing what we can within our capabilities that in itself is satisfying and perhaps the maximum uh, uh, as satisfying as it can be uh, as as life can be so uh, process orientation is what we need uh, to resolve this seem very tiny and powerless and helpless to change things okay so that's the end of my talk and i'm going to stop sharing and we can have question answers thank you so much wow there was a lot in there i'm i'm glad um we we had some um some extra links that we can all follow up i hope we can perhaps uh share the slides later if that's okay oh yeah sure I, i've given links to the slides themselves yeah excellent thank you so much um if the slides are already online perhaps i can yes, post a are. link in the chat oh yeah I, i'll do that yeah oh wonderful thank you thank you um so we did have a little bit about polanyi in there but i wonder if anybody has have uh specific polanyi related questions that we could start with otherwise we could invite jeff to contribute jeff are you still with us <laughs> oh yep i see you Ah, oh, thank you for the link. Excellent. No, that's not mine. Oh, uh, that's Alistair. Quick. Oh, He's I great. see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I was about to put it in, but if that works, then that's fine. Anticipation, he says. Okay. 